Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are exploring the legislative as part of Chapter 2.2, Decision Making in a Representative Democracy. Before we start, let's do a quick recap. The Constitution represents the highest law in our land, which is Singapore. It's constituted of three different branches. We have the Legislative Branch, we have the Executive Branch, we have the Judicial Branch. So, let's take a look at that. The Legislature the executive, the judicial. So the three branches of democratic government. Are you ready for the legislature? Let's go! So in a democracy, no one or part of government or person in the government is allowed to hold too much power. That's why we keep each other in check. Otherwise, it will be no different from monarchy, where we have a king, where the rule is absolute. If he decides that you should, well, Die, you will die. This is Sparta! So, hence, political power is divided into three different branches. So, why do you think democracy was created in such a way? Of course, do think about that because if someone has too much power, think of what they can do. If he decides that you should be jailed indefinitely, what might happen? So, what is the legislature? Let's take a look. The legislature is the law-making body of the government where they make new laws. Let's take a look at where they convene to discuss new laws. The legislature needs to make new laws and alter old ones in the parliament building. One good example is of updating new laws is regarding the personal mobility device or some known as e-scooter. Gee, what a good day for a drive. Well, there's no such devices in the past and in the future, perhaps there are new devices. So as new devices come into play and they do affect the people in Singapore, new laws need to be passed and old ones which are redundant will need to be altered or be removed. So who is in the parliament? There you go. That is our president, Madam Halima Binti Yaakob. Thank you ma'am for serving the nation. She is the current president of Singapore and she will preside in the parliament as the head of the country. This is followed by the prime minister, Mr. Lee Hsien Long. That is him in the past and there you go, that is him currently. Uh, Mr. Heng Sui Kiet is the deputy prime minister and he's the coordinating minister for the economic policies. The cabinet is made of 17 ministers. They may increase or decrease based on the need of the country. And let's take a look. We have Mr. Teo Chi Hien. He's the senior minister and coordinating minister for national security. We have Mr. Taman Shamugaranam. He is the senior minister and coordinating minister for social policies. We have Mr. Ng Eng Heng, minister of defense. Mr. Vivian Balakrishnan, minister of foreign affairs. Mr. K. Shamugan, he's the minister for home affairs and minister for law. Mr. Gan Kim Yong, he's the minister of trade and industry. And Mr. S. Ishwaran, he's the minister for transport, minister in charge of trade relations. So you do realize that they do take on more than just one portfolio. Ms. Grace Fu Haiyan, she's the minister for sustainability and the environment. Mr. Chan Chun Singh, he's the minister for education and minister in charge of the public service. You have Mr. Lawrence Wong, minister of finance and co-chair for multi-ministry task force on COVID-19. He has recently been promoted. Well, we shall find out in a while. Mr. Masagos Zulkifli, he's the minister for Social and Family Development, Second Minister for Health and Minister in Charge of Muslim Affairs. You have Mr. Ong Ye Kun, Minister for Health, Minister in Charge of Aging Issues, which is quite a big issue, and the Co-Chair for Multi-Ministry Task from the COVID-19. Mr. Desmond Lee, Minister of National Development and Minister in Charge of Social Service Integration. And Ms. Josephine Thieu, she's the Minister for Communication and Information, Second Minister for Home Affairs, Minister in Charge of Smart Nation and Minister in Charge of Cyber Security. So we have a number of ministers as well. We have Ms. Indrani Raja, we have Mr. Malik Osman, Mr. Edwin Tong, Mr. Tan Si Leng, we have, we have Ms. Sin An, we have Mr. Chi Hong Tat, Mr. Ko Po Kun, Mr. Tan Kin Hao, and Ms. Rahayu Mazam. Often we'll see this word cabinet reshuffle. Think of the word, if we have a cabinet of people, then we reshuffle them, what do we get? 
That is called when a new political leader reshuffles the minister in the government for he or she changes their jobs so that some of the ministers changes their responsibilities. And one of the important reasons is so that they can see different aspects of Singapore because if you're in charge of transport, most of your responsibility lies within transport. You'll not be in charge of perhaps how the education is run or perhaps how the finance is run in a country. Ministers do need to change once in a while to take on different portfolios and of course when a new leader rises above then he will think that new cabinet might have a reshuffle so that he or she might be able to allocate each minister to their strength. So let's ask Mr Lee Sien Long what he has to say about cabin reshuffle. Two weeks ago I told you I was planning a cabinet reshuffle and today I'm announcing the new lineup. So what's the new lineup? There are some Singapore cabinet changes in 2022. As of June 13, Mr. Lawrence Wong, he's the Deputy Prime Minister now, he has upgraded to the next in charge for Mr. Lee Hsien Long and he's the Minister for Finance, which is a very important role for Singapore. New role, Mr. Tan Kien Hao is the Senior Minister of State, Communication, Information and National Development. Mr. Eric Tua is the Senior Parliamentary Secretary, Culture, Community and Youth and Social and Family Development. We have Ms. Rahayu Mazam. She has been promoted to Senior Parliamentary Secretary, Law and Health. So, other appointments. You have Mr. Chi Hong Tat, Mr. Ko Pung Kun, Ms. San Xue Ling, Mr. Desmond Tan and Mr. Bei Yam King. So, they have each been reshuffled to different political appointments. Let's take a look. It hasn't always been like this with so many people in the parliament. In fact, if you look at when Singapore first became independent, we have a total of 10 ministers. That's it. We have Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, our founding father. The Deputy Prime Minister will be Mr. To Chin Chai. You have S. Raja Ratnam, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Ong Pang Boon, he's Minister for Education. Mr. Go King Sui, Minister for Interior and Defense. Mr. Yong Ling, Minister for Health. Mr. Jake Yong Tong, Minister for Labor. You have Mr. Edmund William Barker for Minister for Law and National Development and Mr. Lin Kim San, Minister for Finance and Mr. Ottoman Wok, Minister for Culture and Social Affairs. You think about it, some of the position hasn't been created yet. The question is why? That we could just have 10 ministers since Singapore has been founded all the way until now. Why not stick to 10? Why have more? So the question need to think about it. Is Singapore the same as previously? If it's not the same, then are there areas where the previous minister would not have covered? So we need someone to be in charge of them so they can help develop Singapore intentionally. So who else is in the parliament? The PP MPs is made up of 70 of them. They are from 16 GRCs, which made up 4, 5, 6 members and 13 come from SMC, single member constituency. So let's take a look. Six members, five members, four members, and SMC. So these are the changes. Three corner fight was our most recent one. And be sure to stay tuned to the next election because that's where fierce debates and valiant promises are made. A handshake is basically a promise, a commitment, a tall order. Means I must meet that tall order and it's for you. And it's for you in sense that three fingers also pointing me, it's also for me, it's for us. And if the result is good, thumbs up, man. If the result is lousy, what happened? Boo! Boo to be happy! Thank you, fellow Singaporeans. So what is a GRC? A GRC is a constituency where voters vote for a whole group of MPs instead of just one, which means that you're voting for four to five people even if you don't like the whole group except for one, you still have to vote the whole group. So the condition is that the group must contain at least one member from minority community in Singapore. In Singapore, we have the majority as Chinese and the Malays, Indians, Eurasian and others are the minorities. So the group must contain one member from the minority community as well and the group must all be from the same party we can't have a mix of PAP and workers party in one group so what are the strengths and weaknesses 
The strength is to ensure minority representation in parliament so that they will not all be made up of Chinese. That's economical for town council to manage larger estates because it will be easier for different people to manage different parts of the entire larger estates. The weakness is that strong members of the GRC team can carry weaker or new MPs into parliament. That means that if we were to vote for someone that is very popular like Mr. Lee Hsien Long, so weaker members such as new MPs whom we do not know may also be voted into parliament because they form the same group. So it's difficult for opposition parties to fill so many candidates for GRC because it is easy to find people but to find ready candidates that are really ready to lead Singapore is not that easy. So to find so many candidates with that credential can be a tall order. So who else is in parliament other than MPP? We have 10 opposition MPs at the moment who are from Workers' Party and is led by Mr. Pritam Singh, who is also the opposition leader. And we have NCMP, non-constituency members of parliament, and it is at the moment taken by Singapore Progress Party. Opposition party of the 14th parliament due to COVID-19, they are taken separately. The conditions, if there are less than 9 opposition candidates in the parliament after these elections, the constitution, which is the highest law in the land, states that NCMPs can be appointed until there are 9 opposition candidates, while they are still the minority. So what is NCMP? NCMP is an opposition candidate that have gained at least 15% of their votes in their constituency and have scored the highest among the losers of the election. Some say they are the, well, best losers, but that is the definition. In addition, up to 9 NMPs can be nominated. They are the nominated MPs. They are not from any political parties. They are non-partisan. They ensure a wider view and representation in parliament so that the views are not restricted just to the political leaders. They contribute independent views in parliament not influenced by either party as well because they are not from any political party. And they are appointed. They are not elected by a special committee. They represent different sectors of Singapore society. That is very important because we do not want a narrow viewpoint of how Singapore society should be defined and look at. This is their sitting position. The current speaker is Mr. Tan Chuan Jing. He is the speaker who decides who speaks and this is their current position. You can take a look. The leaders sits in the middle. We have Mr. Pritan Singh facing Mr. Lee Hsien Long who is the current leader of the incumbent party. And this is the speaker's gallery. To take note, those in white are from People's Action Party. Worker Party is in blue and NCMP are in red. And we have the NMP in green. This is how they look like. So with the president right in the middle. The speaker of parliament in his is Mr. Tan Chuan Jing. He used to be a MP but now he has stepped down to be the speaker of parliament. What does he do? He acts as the leader of the debates in parliament. He enforces the rules of conduct during debate. He decides on who has the right to speak and what parliament will debate. It does not need to be an MP though, but it can be. Does not need to take part in any parliamental debates. He is supposed to be non-partisan. He only votes if they are elected MPs. Most important of all, he must be fair and non-partisan. That is the most important criteria in yellow. How do you create a law? A law is created when first we have the first reading. So someone will come out and propose a new law that has not been passed by the parliament yet. We may need to examine if we need to put a timestamp on the degree conferred by the uni. What do we know? What do we mean by timestamp? One radical idea is to put it as a requirement that the graduates have to attend upgrading courses every five years or so. If you do not upgrade, your degree will fade over time and you no, and you no longer can claim the degree as yours, your credential. What do you think of such a law? So all bills are introduced at the start of a new session of parliament. There will be a few rounds at the new session. They will introduce all bills at the start. Next, we have the second reading where the bill is fully explained by the proposing MP. So if they have something to propose, this will be the time they will fully explain the reasons for the bill, the details of the bill. So all MPs can question the proposal and debate whether the bill is actually necessary. And a vote is taken. A bill must pass before they move on to the third round, which is stage three. At stage three, it will form a committee. So a group of MPs will be chosen for further research into the usefulness of this bill. And while researching the bill, they can gather feedbacks from the expert or public if and when necessary and report their findings to a parliament. Because you can't just create a bill based on a reason and have no research whatsoever, they need such feedback first. Or they could have a committee of the whole house. So 
all MPs will now debate on the details and how to implement the bill. Stage 4 will be the third reading final debate over the bill. Only minor changes allowed you can't cancel the bill at this point. Otherwise, the whole bill is thrown back to stage 3. Stage 5 is the Presidential Council on Minority Rights. At this point, you can take a look at another video which explains Presidential Council on Minorities Rights. If not, if you look at the word Presidential, it's led by the, you guessed it, it's President. This council consists of representatives from each major race and religion in Singapore and has the power to veto a bill. That means that it has the power to reject the bill only if the bill is discriminated against any race or religion. Then they report their finding to the parliament. Stage 6, the president of Singapore need to approve the bill. And once it's approved, then you become an act of parliament and also known as a new Singapore law. So gazetting. Once the new act or law is published in the gazette, it's considered to be in effect on the date of the gazette publication. You can actually search for it online. It's a report published by the Singapore government which lists out all the new laws and amended laws. This is how it looks like. Is the parliament in charge of anything else? Yes. Catching money. The budget. They are in charge of the money and the amount of money that the government needs to spend a year to keep Singapore running. So the community of supply. In March annually, the parliament also serves the community of supply. They debate and decide on the budget of each ministry. The supply view. Supply bill is a budget in which the Committee of Supply presents to the rest of Parliament for debate and voting. And usually, this is quite important because it concerns the budget for each ministry. It's just like your pocket money. Once the supply bill has been passed, the money is free for the ministry to be used. Thank you for staying with me until the end of the video. We have come to the end of the legislative and stay tuned to the, the next video, the executive. Thank you and bye-bye.